uh, to talk about a, a review on the review of antimicrobial resistance to do a start check on where we are. Um, first, let me do the bit of housekeeping. If there is a fire alarm, um, everyone should exit to the rear of the room, go out of the, down the stairs and out the main door where you will have come in. Except in the event, if the fire is out there and there are a second set uh, of stairs out of these doors. So um, hopefully we will not be interrupted by that, but in the event it will, if you hear an alarm, it's a real fire and we should exit the building. Um, so first of all, I just wanna say, you know, we're in this room which has a, a very eye-catching mural and um, you know it, it's a thing of its time but the interesting point was discovered in the back of the room is that it took 23 years to paint and i think that's a very relevant thing on our topic today um, <laughs> and not just because it's frustrating but because it's a very real thing that taking on the challenge of antimicrobial resistance and achieving all that we need to achieve is actually going to be a long-term set of activities with long-term objectives and goals. We need to always remember what the big picture is and think about what do we need to do then to get there over this longer period of time, which is in reality going to be more than the 23 years it took just to paint these four walls here. Um, but in terms of today, we're doing a stock check. Where are we? Where do we need to go? Very importantly. So for us, you know, w with Welcome uh, commissioning this work at Chatham House, we wanted to look at, you know, over this uh, two and a half year window of time, what has happened? And uh, again, I'm going to really emphasize, we hope that an outcome of the report, the discussions today, can create a very clear understanding and agenda of what do we do next? What are the things that we want to see happening so that our 23 plus year set of activities toward AMR do not become 79 years and counting um, and cost many, many lives. You know, it's an interesting thing as well and, and, and not without irony that this is taking place today with Extinction Rebellion uh, protesting very nearby on the climate change issue. And of course, many people have likened this to a threat on the scale of climate change. It is very similar in respect to it being a tragedy of the commons and how it impacts individuals, but is all about collective actions and activities and not very easily solved. However, I think there is one very big distinction that I think is a positive, uh, and that is that actions that are taken with res in terms of tackling AMR can deliver real progress in the short term and in local ways. This isn't just about what do you do, and it has very, very vague outcomes that hopefully over the long term will solve the problem at some distance and at some future point in time. Action, good action on AMR delivers real results in the near term and, one, and benefits that are locally identifiable. We should build on that as we look toward really addressing this problem for the long term. So I, I should say that, you know, it, it's a, unfortunate that Dame Sally couldn't be here, but her role first with the topic of AMR is indisputably a wonderful one. She is a singular leader in this space, and she is the person responsible for the original commissioning of the review that Wellcome Trust was really very happy and fortunate to be able to co-support with the UK government. But today, Sally is being installed in her new role as the Master of Trinity, and that's a fantastic thing. But for us, much more important, we think, is that she's able to have the role as a special envoy on AMR. And so she will continue to be a strong driver in this space. And just unfortunately, because of this other side job, wasn't able to join us today. Um, now, in, 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 
I should say that thank you very much to Chatham House for taking on this commissioning and delivering the report that will be uh, available to everyone uh, very soon. Uh, today we want to hear about the key findings, which Charles will talk about in a moment, and we want to celebrate progress. There actually is some real progress here, but of course identify those areas where there are gaps and what the next steps might need to be. And then we, we'll have discussions around this, and we really want to recognize where our understanding has moved forward. You know, maybe if we wrote the reports today, we would actually have some differences. It'd be very interesting to hear if the recommendations in some areas might change or if they all stand. And actually, we just need to double down to make progress on that. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Charles, who's going to uh, give you a very brief progress report on this. And an in introduction uh, uh, to Charles, well, you can come up here, though. He is currently Senior Consulting Fellow at Chatham House. And prior to joining Chatham House, he was an economist with the UK Department for in International Development. His research interests at Chatham House have included counterfeit medicines, global health governance, and financing, as well as antimicrobial resistance. He's a PhD in economics from the University of Sussex. Charles. Uh, welcome, everybody. I was supposed to have an iPad here so I could see what my slides are, but can we have my presentation up? So you were supposed to have a report. This is the report, launch of a report. The report isn't here, so <laughs> owing to Extinction Rebellion and the careers not being very creative about how to get a report here. Um, so hopefully it will arrive before the end of the event. But if not, which I, I'm not sure it will be here, um, you can see it online from now. It should be there now from 10 o'clock. Um, then this report you, is being published now is a summary report. There's a much longer report that's taking longer to process but should be published online in about 10 days, I think. So. Um, what I'm doing here is summarizing a summary report. And as you all know, AMR is a very big subject with many different facets. So it's got to be a very partial overview of key findings. And if you read the summary, and the, in particular the full report, you can find more detail and more nuances because it's, it's not easy to make unequivocal statements. So. Um, I think it's undoubtedly true that the review had, uh, has had a big effect in terms of advocacy. So uh, if you Google the 10 million deaths globally, 2050 drug resistant, you can't, last time I did it, you get 5.92 million, which I think is quite a lot. And that's because every government report, every agency report, a lot of academic articles they all have to start off by saying these numbers, which came from, uh, not from the final report actually, although they're in there, but from a report in 2000, December 2014. So from December 2014, these numbers were circulating and raising the profile of AMR politically and in the public <coughs> domain. So I think, uh, you know, in terms of what the AMR review achieved, it was partly uh, its background papers, uh, reports, uh, in particular the one I've just mentioned, um, but also the team and Jim O'Neill talking to people and helping to get things off the ground. So um, one thing was to get it on the international agenda, and Jim was picked because he knew something about <laughs> these countries. He invented BRIC as an acronym, as you all probably know. And somebody added the S later, South Africa. Um, so it was thought he had a special uh, link to these countries. And these countries are very important globally if we are to tackle AMR, that they are on board. So he had, there was quite a lot of success in getting onto the G20 agenda, the G7 agenda, I think the <coughs> 2016 UN political declaration came after the report, but I think it, it, it was 
quite significantly influenced by the report. Uh, the World Bank, in its major um, report on drug-resistant infections, described the review and its background documents as remarkable. Re remarkably good, I think they meant. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm trying to look at the positive achievements. Um, so there have been several new initiatives to which the, report, the review can be uh, held to be partially responsible. So one that is often talked about is, that's the wrong way. Yeah, this is a um, slide of which Kevin Outson is very proud, uh, which kind of summarizes all the different initiatives and new funding that's gone in to AMR in the last few years. Uh, I won't go through it now for lack of time, but um, you can see um, it's evidence of increased activity in the sphere, mainly of early stage research, but also surveillance and some other things that the review covers. Um, then uh, a very uh, significant thing is the way we have managed to reduce agricultural consumption of antibiotics, particularly in high-income countries. So the figure for Europe uh, is, uh, it fell 20% between 2011 and 2016, agricultural use. In the UK, it is announced today, the previous figure was 40%, and there's been some error which is now being corrected. So the actual figure is that it has fallen by 48% between 2013 and 2017. And I'm told that that means we now consume less per kilogram of animal than Denmark. And Denmark is thought to be one of the leaders in the field. Uh, Norway is a very, very long way, the, by far the lowest. Um, and in the US in uh, 2017, after they had completed their phasing out of growth, uh, use of antibiotics in, in feed for growth promotion, uh, sales fell by 33%. I'm told that's not just due to that, uh, the phasing out, but it is a very um, significant decline. Um, in LMICs, this is, the problem is um, the data is very, uh, not very good, uh, and so it's a bit of guesswork is involved, but it's fairly safe to say that consumption of antibiotics is rising quite quickly, um, and uh, we're not quite, uh, more attention needs to be paid to, to dealing with that. On the other hand, India, China and India both taking steps to ban the use of colostin, which won't ban because it's a, a last resort um, antibiotic for use in humans, uh, in uh, animal feed, and in India they've banned it altogether in agriculture, just can't use it even for therapy, as I understand it, if the law is enforced. <coughs> um, so the re review made recommendations about awareness raising and we discuss these at quite some length in, in the main report. Um, so there has been investment in awareness raising, uh, awareness weeks with WHO and national ones, but there is um, an issue about how much raising awareness actually changes behavior. So sometimes even they, some are, some articles say uh, it can have the perverse effect. If you raise awareness to something, people actually use more of it even when uh, you're asking them to use less. So it's just, it's quite a complicated subject and we don't necessarily always have the appropriate messages or know what to say in different circumstances. And in low and middle income countries, often they don't have much choice. You know, either you've got an antibiotic available or there's only one sort of antibiotic available or you can't afford the antibiotic so any amount of awareness raising won't give you any more choice. You have to do what uh, is possible. 
So um, the other, another recommendation was to restrict uh, the use of over-the-counter over sales of antibiotics. Um, the research tends to show that even in high-income countries, a surprisingly high minority of subscriptions are, uh, occur without prescription. Uh, either you keep antibiotics you haven't used, or uh, there are various other means you, you use <coughs> antibiotics without prescription. In uh, low- and middle-income countries, um, often there's no alternative to relying on over-the-counter sales because of inadequacies in healthcare provision. And so if you want antibiotics and can afford it, you go to your local supplier uh, who might give you anything, whether it's appropriate or not. Um, so. Uh, the other point is then, because of lack of resources and inadequate provision, uh, many patients go without antibiotics they actually need. So for this reason, the use of antibiotics, um, antibiotics are often used because of the inadequacies in, uh, of the provision for <coughs> health care facilities and in the community more generally. So you, you find you need to use antibiotics because of the prevalence of infection, or if you don't have them, you don't get better. Um, so the question is, um, are we doing sufficient to address the social and economic causes that lead to the prevalence of unhygienic conditions? Um, a sustainable reduction or mitigation of AMR requires an improvement in those fundamental infrastructural facilities. So um, this is a recent figure. In LMIC, it's an <coughs> estimated 900 million people still use healthcare facilities with no water service, and 1.5 billion use facilities with no sanitation services. So this is a repetition of what I've said. Universal health coverage would improve access to antibiotics and reduce the incentive to go outside the system and get your antibiotics over the counter. So I see a, quite a strong link between universal health coverage and getting the AMR situation improved. Uh, so this is saying much the same thing. This is very important. Jim has made the, made the point that um, perhaps the IMF should use the approach policies on AMR as one element in assessing um, the performance of countries in uh, economic performance. So um, he might discuss that later, I think. Um, then we're making progress in surveillance, but it's very difficult to do, um, uh, particularly in the agricultural sector. So we need to make more effort to improve surveillance. Without surveillance, efforts to combat AMR are essentially flying blind. And I left this to last, or it's the second of the messages. <laughs> So the most expensive recommendation in, in the review was for a system of market entry rewards, uh, costed at about 40 billion pounds, dollars. Much the same thing there. <laughs> uh? Half billion. Oh, sorry. That's my error then. Um, a lot of money anyway. <laughs> and. Um, this has been recommended subsequently by a number of other reports, endorsed by other reports, by reputable people, and it's been talked about and around in sort of policy circles in the G20 and the G7, but in the end, no one has been prepared to bite that bullet. Um, in the UK, and um, just as an example, there have been some steps. So in the UK, they're trying to develop a pilot project 
uh, on the so-called Netflix basis, where <coughs> you will reward the company producing an antibiotic in a way unrelated to its use, as one does with Netflix. You, buy, you pay a monthly subscription and you use it to whatever extent you like. Um, but exactly how that's going to work and how much money is attached to it, so th that's sort of one facet of the market entry reward scheme. You divorce the payment for the R&D from um, the sale price of the product. But in, in the market entry reward system, you're offering, say, $1 billion to develop a, a needed antibiotic. Um, that $1 billion is not in the Netflix model. And meanwhile, we've had a, a lot of evidence of deterioration in the, um, in the antibiotic market. Uh, we had the, the demise of Achiagen, who actually produced a, an approved marketed antibiotic and then went into administration because they weren't making enough revenue to recoup the costs they had incurred. Then nearly the, at the end now. So, governance. We have with us Haile Getuhun from WHO, and one of his responsibilities is to look at the follow up of the interagency coordination group on antimicrobial resistance. And in regards of governance, which the review um, suggested something similar, not in, with the detail here. Uh, the ICG, which reported this year, recommended a global leadership group and a new panel like the IPCC to gather evidence and present it to policymakers on the um, impact of AMR. Um, so we look forward to hearing how these recommendations are being implemented. Um, Haile is head of a tripartite sectorate with FAO and OIE in WHO, and will those be implemented? So uh, this is the final slide. So <laughs> it's rather appropriate today. So um, this is Sally Davis saying, <laughs> you may laugh, I could not possibly comment. So, but my point is not, you know, is it more serious than climate change? Uh, it's um, in the climate, I just wonder if it's relevant to AMR. In the climate change debate, we talk about mitigation, which is about reducing emissions, and we talk about adaptation, which is adapting to rising sea levels and all the other consequences of climate change, and whether the right balance is being struck between those two. So is there a parallel with AMR? Have we struck the right balance between mitigating AMR through seeking behavior change, <coughs> investing in vaccines and diagnostics, and developing the social and economic infrastructure which will reduce the spread of infection. Or, um, and then sh adapting to AMR, I think, means principally through efforts to incentivize R&D. So to produce, because we've got resistance ongoing, we, we produce more and more drugs to which ultimately resistance will also develop. So my question is, is this a useful framework to look at the AMR problem in. And I don't know the answer, but I just thought I'd put it forward. Thank you very much. I can ask there the panelists to join me on the stage, please. And uh, while the panelists are coming up, just to let everyone know, uh, what we will do is each panelist will speak briefly on their perspective uh, in terms of, of where we stand, where, where we'd like to go. And then we'll open up to questions from the floor. But I, I very much am hoping that we can have a very dynamic dialogue, not only on stage here, but with everyone in the room. I mean, this is a very important that we are working uh, in a very collaborative fashion, after all. And all of you in this room are really part of, uh, of the action that, that, that we need to take. So um, what I will do now is very briefly introduce everyone. So to my immediate left is Jyoti Joshi, who is the head of South Asia 
at the Center for Disease Dynamics, Economics, and Policy, also a professor at the Amity Institute for Public Health in Delhi. Uh, before joining the center, Dr. Joshi was at the Public Health Foundation of India and has nearly 20 years of experience in maternal child health, public health policy, immunization, and vaccine safety. She trained as a medical doctor and also has an MSc in infectious diseases from uh, the London School here as well. Um, and beside her, we have Estelle um, Mbadawe. Um, Estelle is the Senior Special Assistant to, of, of Health Services to MO State Governor. Um, she has been the Country Coordinator for Global Antibiotics Resistance Partnership Project in Nigeria and is a founding partner of the D Ducet Blue Solutions. She has worked on various projects improving patient safety and delivery quality in healthcare, both in Nigeria and in the UK, with a key focus on the strategies to combat AMR. She's a pharmacist with an MSc in health policy, planning, and financing. Uh, beside her is Hallie Gettehun, who, as uh, Charles has already introduced, is currently uh, the head of the Secretariat, now responsible for delivering on the recommendations from the UN Interagency uh, Coordination Group. Um, before that, Hallie was responsible for leading the Secretariat within the UN IECG group in bringing forward those recommendations. He's a medical doctor who has uh, a very long experience in TB. And uh, last but certainly not least is Jim O'Neill, who probably everyone knows here, but nonetheless, uh, really important to introduce him because the importance to us is the role that he took on to lead the review on AMR and delivering those recommendations of that review, but building from his experience and knowledge as an economist in Goldman Sachs. And he continues now as chair of Chatham House and um, hopefully will we'll play an ongoing role in, in uh, advocacy on this issue for AMR. So what I would like to do, if I could, I'm going to be a, a little bit sticking to, to the order of, of my questions and start with Hallie. Um, and, and really, it would be good if you could give us your perspective uh, from within the Secretariat for ICG work of where are we and where do we need to go? And of course, any reflections on progress overall? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much also for the opportunity. Um, I would like first to start by, you know, reminding how uh, antimicrobial resistance is uh, a complex issue that requires a comprehensive uh, collective response. And having said that, and also following you know, the review by uh, Sir Jim O'Neill, the uh, political declaration of the UN in 2016 was the chapter changing uh, event uh, for the overall our you know, response uh, in terms of the UN system and member states engagement is also uh, considered. Uh, one of the recommendations of that political declaration was the establishment of a UN interagency coordination group uh, on ad hoc basis for looking at the global response, including governance, and to provide a report to the Secretary General in two years' time. So the ICG was established by that political declaration, and uh, it was composed of both the um, uh, institutional members and individual you know, members. The uh, secretariat was provided by the tripartite, by WHO, uh, FAO, and OIE. And uh, ICG has uh, a little bit of a rocky start, uh, so to speak, but I, I think it has also been uh, the uh, result of you know having a design where you can have an institutional members and then individual members and how really also to reconcile that for a common you know a goal but that has been actually uh, also instrumental in steering the global response around you know AMR in general 
So it was organized into you know, five uh, subgroups, you know, basically to look really the key, actually six, uh, really to look all the essential objectives of the Global Action Plan, which was uh, originally uh, uh, endorsed in the WHA in 2015, and then subsequently also in the FAO and the OIE Governing Council, really bringing their interest for, for, for AMR. So having said that, uh, the ISCG, you know, as part of its governance, the issues that were also discussed during its deliberation was whether we have having the right governance structure really to respond to this uh, threat. And that has stirred a lot of uh, um, commotions and engagement also from, you know, the UN system and from the tripartite. And uh, also what has happened during the uh, establishment of the ICG also, WH also undergoing, you know, change election into a new DG. And when Dr. Tedros came as the new DG of WHO, one thing he also put as a priority was antimicrobial resistance and to respond. And when WHO developed its global program of work, or sort of the five-year strategic plan, uh, antimicrobial resistance also came as really the priority in that which has also helped uh, to uh, coordinate or play its you know, pivotal role within the tripartite, within the One Health response. So that actually also boosted WHO's engagement and coordination with the other tripartite organizations in providing the secretariat support for the ISCG. And I would like also to acknowledge the support of the Wellcome Trust at this point, really in helping the secretariat uh, of uh, the ISCG, you know, financially, which has been instrumental. So ISCG has over two years of deliberation and also really undergoing a very transparent and participatory manner it came up with its report uh, that constitute, you know, 14 recommendations. And our original idea was actually to have 10 <laughs> recommendations, but finally, you know, it went into 14, so it won't, you know, uh, contradict with the 10 commandments, although <laughs> the whole issue, you know, what has been really in uh, Jim O'Neill's review is almost, you know, embedded. And we have actually, when ISCG developed uh, those recommendations, that review, and all other reports were critically reviewed. And we brought all the recommendations that are out there, and we critically reviewed each and every recommendation. So the ISCG intention was really to make its recommendation to be catalytic of what is already existing, and also really to have something that would change the course and for those recommendations that were not able to be implemented. So with this uh, notion, the IACG submitted its recommendations, 14 recommendations to the Secretary General on uh, April 29th. Uh, and the Secretary General has actually, uh, you know, uh, expressed his support and commitment and he subsequently actually wrote his report, you know, based on the ISCG recommendation to member states, which was released in early June, that also calls for the tripartite organizations, WHO, FAO, and OIE, to establish a tripartite joint secretariat to coordinate the global response, as well as follow through the implementation of the ISCG recommendation. So, the tripartite secretariat has been established since then. The tripartite organizations get together, agreed on its terms of reference, submitted it to the secretary general, and we are now operationalizing the secretariat. So that's where we are. And uh, as a follow-up of the ICG recommendations, this secretariat will take the lead in making sure the recommendations, each and every recommendation uh, is implemented uh, in close uh, collaboration, not only with the tripartite agencies, but also other agencies. But at the end of the day, the impact and the result should be at country level. And that is where we have the biggest uh, gap at this point in time. So the ICG recommendation address that as a central piece, and that will also be our uh, pillar 
really to coordinate our response. So I think in a nutshell, this is the follow-up, but I can come up in the specific questions at a later stage. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have Juan Lebroff connected by Skype? I don't know if Charles. Is Juan connected? Do we? Ah, very good. Sorry. So, so uh, hello, Juan. Thank you for, for joining us. I, I uh, sh should introduce Juan because he wasn't able to join us on stage, but we're very, very fortunate that he at least is able to participate uh, by Skype. So Juan is Chief Veterinary Officer at FAO and has been for about a decade now. He also is the Antimicrobial Resistance Coordinator for FAO. Um, he participated in the IACG group and um, has uh, uh, been a strong advocate in a One Health approach to addressing this issue. So Juan, I think that it would be very good if you could share with the group uh, something from that One Health perspective and what progress do you think has been made uh, with respect to One Health and what recommendations do you think there, there should be to better reflect the key challenges in approaching this in a One Health way? Well, thank you very much for, uh, for having me joining the, the panel. I thank uh, Chatham House and also Welcome Trust uh, to have put it together and, and Charles for having been able to coordinate my video link uh, to you and my, I apologize for my inability to be with you in London. So when I am, I'm, yes, I am the Chief Veterinary Officer. I, I, the FAO Coordinator for AMR Coordinator is a, a big word uh, because, as you well point out, uh, the AMR issue is is very very complex. It's, I think in a, there's a certain degree of complexity as we deal with our food and agriculture systems. I recognize that at WHO you're perhaps more focused on one type of species, and and at the World Organization for Animal Health, the OIE. The focus is, is, is looking at, um, at animal health, whether terrestrial or aquatic. Here at FAO, it's land, soil, uh, economic and social development, forestry, agriculture, and consumer protection. Um, and as you pointed out, that surveillance, to be able to look at shrimp and peaches and, and wheat and tilapia and bees, uh, and dairy and swine, uh, as well as Codex Alimentarius, the AMR, AMU issues are quite, quite um, uh, complex. And in the production systems, you may have the, those interests, uh, high commercial intercontinental food systems that comply with their own internal regulations, but also the buyer, seller, export, WTO, WCO. But then we have, we're dealing with the majority of food production occurring in uh, very small holdings. And particularly, uh, it's women that are producing most food on earth. Um, and so to tailor our communications from a very much of a One Health perspective from the development agenda is uh, competing with other things. We talk about food safety, but what about food security? Um, what, what will my family eat tonight? What will my family have for tomorrow? These are some of the more complex issues on the uh, low and middle income countries or poverty in developing countries is what, how am I going to feed my family tonight? So to raise the AMR issue uh, and a priority is, um, a tall task. Uh, hard for me to go into war-torn to areas, uh, not to mention specific countries, and to talk about the, the imminent threat of antimicrobial resistance. So uh, one of the things from our, more from the tripartite, our, our, our work with uh, WHO, OIE, and FAO, uh, and One Health in trying to address uh, this issue from a multidisciplinary point of view and reaching out to, to partners, whether it's NGOs or civil society, uh, countries, think tanks, 
um, academics. Um, that has been much better today than it was 10 years ago. Uh, I complain, and many of you, some people on the panel know me well enough, uh, I do complain that just by having a veterinarian on the panel or uh, participate in a meeting does not make it one health. I don't want to be cosmetic, uh, a cosmetic presence to what it often looks like a very much of a public health-led agenda. Uh, one of the Ten Commandments, and looking at the research and development, and even in the write-up that we have seen for this particular panel discussion, we see that the, the research agenda is still very much focused on new drugs and new drugs for human health. I'm very, very pleased to see that the emphasis has been made with point-of-care diagnostics, uh, so that physicians, dentists, veterinarians, um, whomever, nurses, can make the right decision about what antimicrobial to use. I think that is very, very important. In the veterinary realm, for aquaculture or for terrestrial animals, this has to be very cost-effective and accessible. If your uh, lateral flow device uh, technologies or your handheld PCR is more than one euro per test, that makes it quite irrelevant to me to be able to use it wisely. Sorry, I'm adjusting my phone a little bit. Uh, I'm also very pleased to see that the vaccine um, research and developing is taking hold. Again, this is very much focused on the uh, human health side and perhaps not enough attention to the vaccines that are accessible as well as of good quality to be used in the veterinary realm. Sorry, while I adjust my phone, or it slips. Uh, in, your, in the Ten Commandments, I do see that there is reference to IPC. The IPC, um, in, the, in, in, in the food and agriculture realm, we talk about biosecurity. And it would be good to see kind of an interlink between the language that we use both in the animal world and the human health world, or at least in the clinical care uh, realm of IPC, because we do have parallel systems there. So with the Ten Commandments, um, and in number three to say, you know, the reduction of use, I would say that the same thing could happen in the clinical or hospital physician setting. So uh, uh, we still have to bridge some of the language gaps in One Health and not be accusatory in one realm or another, because we're all responsible for this. In the write-up, I would say, I do see that um, uh, there is a gap looking at the plant, the plant area. We, antimicrobials are increasingly being used in crop agriculture. You'd be surprised to learn that the term streptomycin with my colleagues the crop area recognized streptomycin as a pesticide not as an antimicrobial so if it's a pesticide it enters into a whole different regulatory uh, channel of affairs so again good communication increased the awareness what the differences are lie where the common areas that we need to tackle uh, need to be addressed. So I, I would say that the, the plant crop area, when we talk about overuse in, in food and agriculture or in animals, let's not forget plants. One of the tools that we have developed here at FAO is uh, for low and middle income countries and appreciate very much about that the mural next to you took 23 years and it's going to take us four or five decades to get where Denmark or Norway is, um, is a progressive management pathway that will look at the reality on the ground, let's say in the poultry sector, which may be different from the dairy or the tulip sector, and how can we reach those international standards, speaking to stakeholders. 
So the progressive management pathway for antimicrobial resistance really brings in these different sectors in agriculture. WHO has really liked this, and they want to make it more a One Health progressive management pathway. And we would like for them to take that aspect that is of interest to public health and use the same type of methodology to make it a more of a public health or a One Health approach to, to, to the situation. One area where I do see uh, that we need to have that investment also is in waste management, not only in the pharmaceutical eff effluents, but what are we doing? What are the, what's the technology like to be able to decrease in environmental contamination from, in this case, uh, overuse of, um, uh, or abuse of antimicrobials uh, in the animal terrestrial or aquatic sector. So waste management is something that I would like to underline and, and affects us all so very much of a one health perspective of environment, human health, and animal health. So let me, let me end with that and I'll be happy to entertain questions, opinions, uh, anything else. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Juan. And now if Estelle could uh, share her perspective from country level in Nigeria and, and, and then reflect that upward uh, for how things are going in the low and middle income country setting and, and where you would like to see us go. Yes, um, thank you so much for that. Um, thank you for being on this panel. Um, the Nigerian experience I'll share from, you know, like you mentioned in my introduction, I now have a new role where I'm advising one of the governors of the state. So I'm gonna be just talking from the country level, but also the need for the state's involvement to really get um, things moving. So for Nigeria, we started for following the declaration in 2016. We set up the, um, the Secretariat for AMR at the Nigeria Center for Disease Control. So we started the coordination of developing a national action plan following a situation analysis. And one really in interesting thing for Nigeria is that we did it in quite a short time. We did it, we had about four months from the deadline to achieve this. So we, we had a very strong One Health um, approach to it because I think we just did not have the time. So we had the agri environment and health sectors really come together, sit together and really pull, you know, roll our sleeves up and really develop this plan. So our plan was very um, Nigeria focused in terms of the situation analysis. We tried to look at some of the challenges in terms of awareness creation, in terms of use, look at the challenges around the quality of medicine because that's also the issue with fake drugs and some of those challenges that are unique in that setting. So following our plan, we had, um, we're one of the green countries for our plan, which is a great one for Nigeria. And then we started looking at implementation strategies and looking at, looking at it from the five pillars. So for awareness, um, we've made some progress for awareness. There's, you know, more focus from government, from federal government, you know, Nigeria has a three tier system and the state government. So we do the national, um, the World Antibiotics Awareness Week, which we really get involved. We really build in with the, with the, um, the three sectors to really develop the strategies for that. But one thing with awareness that we're not doing very well is bringing it down to the, the grassroots, so to speak. So the high level awareness is done, but the grassroots is not really happening. And when you find that, when you do some of that awareness, like, you know, you do road shows, you create awareness in the, in the grassroots, you really see that people actually will change their behavior. Um, there's need to do more comprehensive study, looking at CAP studies, looking at from both the, the healthcare professionals in the agri sector as well, and the, the public to see what the real drivers are. I think we don't have the strong input from in the Nigeria setting to really see what really drives the change. We know access to good healthcare and good quality healthcare is gonna be a driver. So people get antibiotics over the counter, they'll go to the pharmacist first because obviously you don't have to pay any fees to access um, medicines from the pharmacy. And also from the pharmacy point of view, you're trying to look at the drivers for them in terms of sales. So how will regulation really impact the changes in that level? So awareness is really good, but we need to look at access and the challenges in the health sector as a whole to mitigate access, um, you know, being able to buy antibiotics over the counter. For surveillance, um, 
we've done, there's been a lot of push for surveillance. You know, I'm, I'm part of the, um, the Fleming Fund team. So I worked with the Fleming Fund team, both for the country grant, doing some reviews for the country grant, and also working with the Fleming Fund team for the regional grant. So surveillance has moved where Nigeria is reported to glass, which is great. But one thing that is happening with surveillance is that we're really looking now at what is the quality of the data that surveillance is going, you know, that the surveillance agenda is using to inform policy. So we have data that is in, you know, the data being collected from the different programs is looking at data that is not very good because the, the systems in the laboratories, the systems of AMU, the way data is collected is not very strong. So if we use that data to report on policy, you're then going to have a skewed data input from the get-go. So this is something that at the country level that there's a lot of concerns in how we're using this data to really drive, to drive policy. But for surveillance, really interesting with the, with the grants is that what we're doing with the, with the agri sector is um, we've, we've actually, Nigeria is actually the first country for the Fleming Fund where they've included the aquaculture because there's so much hobby farming in the country. So they really, that's the first time they've included aquaculture in the Fleming Fund um, round. So that's very interesting. So we're really trying to speak to surveillance and speak to data collection from the needs of the country and speak to you know, what the changes, what the challenges for implementation would be at that level. Um, if I take it to IPC, I think with IPC, we've, we've made some progress with IPC. Um, there's now, you know, one of the things we pulled up in our, in our strategy, in our National Action Plan, was the need for more to sort of quantify what the career, the IPC career path would be. And this is obviously mentioned in the, in the report where we're looking at the need for more funding and more pay skill. You know, we had the, the summary of pay for different specialties and public health and IPC is quite low. So one thing we've done with Nigeria, we've now developed a curriculum for training both at the frontline health workers and also at the, at the facility level what IPC strategies could look like. But again, this is, you know, policies are great. Um, the implementation, you know, like we say, we have great policies. I think Nigeria develops very, very strong policies, but it's when we go to implementation and how that implementation speaks back to policy changes and using that data to really drive change in that sector. So they still, you know, a lot of work, some progress has been made definitely for, um, for IPC, but it's just the need to shift that with how we're really looking at IPC, the basic level of IPC, the sanitation, the access to clean water, the facilities, the access to clean water, both in the public, in the, um, in the, in the, you know, for the general public to access clean water as well. And we're trying to do really interesting things by making sure you're building this into the school curriculum as well from primary school, doing a lot of innovative things with hand hygiene teaching in schools, getting them to build their own strategies of what IPC could be. Because what we're finding is that the children obviously drive this and take it back to their parents, etc. So IPC has made some progress, but you know, without the, the infrastructure to really drive the change from ensuring this, you know, good water, good sanitation, is going to still be a little bottleneck for the country. Um, for stewardship, um, again, like I mentioned, the challenge with looking at access to, to antibiotics and seeing how the market, the supply side and the demand side, how that change in the strategy could really, um, you know, sort of change the, the landscape for how, how, we, how we drive stewardship. So we're looking at the, the rational use, we're looking at the development of guidelines because that's something that empirically there's a lot of empirical use of antibiotics. We need to create more formula, um, formularies, some definite guidance to guide prescribing patterns, both human health and obviously in the animal health sector. So this is something that we're working with from, from a country level. Um, just recently, I was working on the, the essential drugs management guideline for the country and looking at how we can drive you know, the information, the data from the laboratories, obviously looking at surveillance, how the data from the laboratory is going to feed back to the choice of antibiotics, will feed back to the availability of the antibiotics at the country. So it's sort of like a three-pronged approach to see how data, you know, AMU and AMR data 
could drive clinicians and prescribing patterns and could drive availability and access from the pharmacy point of view. Um, for R&D, I think we need to do more in terms of definitely, I think globally, R&D, and you know, that's a big, a big challenge. But what we've done, what's um, a lot of interesting things going on in Nigeria with looking at the use of probiotics as a, um, as a alternative. alternative, yes, as an alternative to antibiotics used in farming. So a lot of the northern farmers, which is where a lot of the farming happens, there's, there's some research going on in that space to see how you can use probiotics as an alternative. But again, is the scale of it. It's happening in very small um, pockets and there needs to be more scale on that. And I think in Nigeria, we also need to look at how we use, we actually look at the data for the country in terms of to see what impact it's going to have. You know, we obviously referenced this great review and the numbers in terms of 10 million debts and 100, um, 100 trillion dollars. Um, but I think we need to sort of bring it down to Nigeria level, what this actually means for us, what, what this is going to mean in terms of ability to provide quality health care and obviously universal health coverage. But one thing that we need to do, so with the, with the Global Antibiotics Partnership Project, um, one thing that we did with WHO actually is we did a stakeholder map to look at what the different players are, what the different stakeholders are, and see where the different programs currently happening in the country meets um, in terms of AMR, what the different partners are doing. So this was something that was really good, and we're able to identify where the different players are, but I think there's need to scale this up, both at the project level and obviously at the global level, to see, because you know, there's so many new players in this space, and there's a lot of duplication of efforts, is to see how we can really pull things together, understand where different players are, and see how we can then maximize the impact of what is happening. Um, and I think that's really, in terms of Nigeria, you know, for me, is how we now take it from the country level and the high level impact with my new role to see how we can take it down to the state. To, because when you get the states involved, you know, it's a smaller pool, you can really drive the policy and drive the changes at that level. And of course, then it will all become a collective gain for the country. So I think that's sort of where we are in Nigeria at the moment. Great. Thank yeah. you. Jyoti, you've done a lot of research in this area and looking across um, all aspects of, uh, of what could be done. So what are your reflections on where we are and what we need to do? Great. Thank you for inviting me here and having me for the discussion. I think I'll take it forward from what the colleague from FAO and Estel said. The one thing about AMR, uh, I mean, having worked in vaccination programs and infectious diseases overall, I find is AMR tends to fall between the divide, the divide between health and non-health sectors, like what he talked about, food security versus food safety, uh, between clinical and public health, where you have the clinicians uh, prioritizing what antibiotics to give, even if tests are available or not, between the public health aspects of mass administration or not, and you know, then the interventions that can be done. So this divide, first of all, needs to be overcome. And AMR, I think he rightly said that AMR doesn't have to be a health agenda alone. It is a development issue. When I'm doing research now with the veterinary sector, with the poultry people, when I go and say, talk about how antibiotics get used, there's, there's a lot of uh, lack of clarity amongst both the people who are doing the research as well as the industry with whom you have to talk. And it's not just the pharma industry we are talking about. It's even the poultry industry, the livestock industry they all have their interest involved. So when we go as researchers, there is hesitation to talk. And to overcome this, to even have some kind of discussion, we first need to build bridges and connect. So I think the one big message I feel in AMR we need to do is connect beyond the lab, beyond the healthcare setting to other sectors and look for solutions that work step by step. And from a country perspective, like talking to countries, helping them write action plans or implement them, they are looking for action. So they are, there's a, the other gap is the lack of operational models. So everybody talks of One Health and everybody wants to do, and that's great. I think what the review has done and what uh, so, so much action that's happening ever since it was part of the UN and the G7, G20, et cetera, declarations, that AMR has come on the agenda. It has reached the limelight, but now we need to follow up with operational models of things that can work. And we talked about the tripartite, but I think it's, there's also that environment sector which is not talked about much, though it's included, I think, in the tripartite plus. At the country level, when we're doing work, 
there's a lack of uh, the lack of information, first of all, on how much which sector is responsible. So the policymakers or the program managers would like to do something about AMR, but what should do they first? Should they act on the environment? Should they act on the uh, veterinary sector? Should they act on the human side? Which is the driver? Those kind of information gaps are the ones that need to be filled. And this gap is not, I would say, it's not global. It couldn't be regional. Many a times it will be country specific and your uh, uh, industrial profile specific. So I think those kind of granularities within the data is what is required. There is more information that needs to be uh, available, and it is not available, unfortunately, at the moment. So we have to work together, whether it's the industry, the researchers, the academics, and the government. So the food security versus food safety example was very good because you have different government departments sitting across the table trying to sort out the issue. When I do research and reach out to different uh, stakeholders as regulators, for example. We're doing a project on smart regulations for AMR. So every one of them is keen to do something, but they don't know what to do. And they're happy to come and join the discussions. And definitely, it's a way forward that we have found so far in the one year that we have gone through with the project. So, so that's amazing, I think, the interest that has come on board in terms of research and the request for data and solutions is great. But the ch challenge now lies in converting this interest uh, and AMR from just a research topic to a program implementation mode. So we have, for example, a vaccination program in low and middle income countries, which has delivered for a long time. And it's doing well. We're adding newer vaccines. But what has been the impact of these vaccines on AMR? Or how uh, useful can they be for the antimicrobial resistance perspective is not known. Can there be specific vaccines? How will they be used in low middle income settings for curative or therapeutic purposes. That is some, a divide which I feel needs to be discussed. And I'm just talking of human health. I think the colleague from FAO talked about veterinary vaccines, veterinary uh, therapeutic or prophylactic vaccines. So those discussions beyond our comfort zones are needed. And I think it started to a large extent with the action plans being announced. But yes, now countries are grappling, especially in the low middle income countries, in the Asian continent where I'm coming from, countries are grappling with examples. Many of them have interests and areas which they are keen to take forward. So I think that's where they need support. And these kind of best practices that will be implemented over this last, this next one year or two will then need to be documented or available to other countries to understand that they don't have to replicate, but take forward from what has worked together. So we need these groups to meet regularly, to exchange information, to publish their results, to have that kind of support. And then the countries need to be lauded for what they do for each sector. And those are small innovations, I guess, but these, needs to be, these need to be got together. A lot will be done, I'm sure, with the IACG and with the kind of inputs that Welcome has. I think those are the needs of the hour. Great. Thank you very much. Jim, you get the last word from the panel. Um, and, and I'm going to ask you to be very short so that we can uh, okay. engage people in, in questions. OK, I'll try to be brief, which is, those of you that know me, is sometimes tricky. Um, so it's lovely to hear from the three of uh, people here about, particularly in progress in a, such an important country as Nigeria, it's lovely. So I, I've got a, a few comments quickly. So you, you touched on Extinction Rebellion, uh, and I, I've been thinking for the, the past few weeks that. You know, where, where is AMR's Greta Thunberg? Um, but I find myself listening to some of this discussion. Actually, do, does AMR need a Greta Thunberg? I, you know, my, my mind, I don't know. Second thing to say in that regard, and uh, I've, I, I've written, I've emailed him so he knows that I'm teasing him about this. So the guy that formally asked me to do this review, David Cameron, when he was prime minister, even though it was independent, as uh, I'm sure many people know here, has just published this ridiculously ginormous book. I think it's slightly less than 800 pages. There were two pages in there about AMR. And uh, as I said to him, uh, actually some might argue that it's the most important thing you did as a prime minister, taking this to a globally in important stage, and it only two pages. And I, I, it's kind of that link to what I've just said, it tells me that there's a positioning uh, issue for antimicrobial resistance still, even in uh, developed country. 
Uh, I shan't reveal a lot of what David's answer to me was when I said these things to him, but it, it was interesting. And I think the, there is a, a sort of, I'd call it a positioning issue. Uh, which takes me to the third thing. You, you deliberately challenged me about recommendations that might be different. And uh, I guess I can think of, uh, and which leads me to four of my remaining points. So there are four things in a way. The first of which is uh, on the positioning, as some of you have often heard me say. Um, I, in some ways, I, would have, I wish we would have presented the numbers in a sort of investment return sense. A, a very smart hedge fund guy that I'm very friendly with said to me, a week after our final report, so you're telling me that $42 billion over 10 years would avoid a lost $100 trillion? And he said, that, that is a Buffett-esque type 2,000% return. And I, I was so annoyed at myself that I hadn't thought about that. We, we should have done that. because, And it, this is, I think, more applicable to a number of points you all make, that the whole notion of investing in preventive health interventions should be seen uh, in an economic context instead of what inevitably ends up happening is these staggering amounts on health responsiveness. Uh, and... Unless we, deal, I'll come back, unless we deal with some issues that aren't being dealt with, that's what is going to end up happening in AMR. And it, it's sort of crazy. Um, second thing that I wish we would have done um, is linked to that, push more for something that Charles touched on, uh, trying to persuade the IMF that they can play a role. Uh, and to their credit, uh, the IMF actually did host... Uh, a day with myself and Peter Sands, the now head of the Global Fund, uh, about this issue, specifically to encourage the IMF to include health uh, preventiveness or health systems as part of the so-called Article 4 series, uh, which is, um, now teasing the IMF instead of our ex-Prime Minister, one of the few things that anybody ever pays any attention to what the IMF says, because it can actually influence countries' credit ratings. And as a sort of, I'd call it a positive, supportive reminder to the efforts that countries are doing in themselves. I'm pretty sure that if Nigeria and India and others knew that the IMF was going to be sticking its nose into having a view on how, how good their health system was from an economic perspective, it would probably play a role on these really big, deep, you know, 23-year-old uh, future challenges. Uh, the other one, uh, a third of the fourth of these, is uh, the issue of um, should, should some aspects of I AMR deaths actually end up on health certificates, uh, which is a tricky issue. But uh, uh, I've heard Sally uh, talk about it. I think she's now a fan of the idea. Uh, you know, a lot, it is, it, one of the reasons why a lot of human beings don't think it's relevant for their lives is because they're never told or they don't know of anybody in their family that's been said they've died because of it. Uh, and I think certainly in the case of uh, genuine resistance to all antibiotics, it's something that should a, a proactive government in the West should initiate, consider doing. And then lastly, controversially linked into... Uh, uh, the, uh, the never-ending issue of new drugs. I wish we wouldn't have been uh, quite as uh, open-minded with all the options we put on the table for how you might finance. And Charles, it was 18 billion of the 42 billion uh, to do with the market for new drugs. I wish we wouldn't have been so uh, unprovocative, and people think we were provocative, about... Uh, the market failure involving pharmaceutical companies because, as I say frequently, the amount of talk on this issue is, even makes my old people in the world of finance seem subdued. It's <laughs> staggering. And yet nothing has happened other than more and more pharmaceutical companies getting out of it. And I think if we would have risked being even noisier than we were about one of the options of pay or play, maybe it might have shamed them into doing more. And I... Linked to that, it is interesting, and this is a big issue for me chairing Chatham House in this, this growing era of, of what I call profit with purpose. The US Business Roundtable, those of you involved in business might be aware of this, about a month ago has put out a big statement uh, about 
how they kind of get they have a duty in life to do more than just reward their shareholders. Cynics think it's just because of the rise of Elizabeth Warren. Maybe true, but they've said it. And I hope that the pharmaceutical companies that sign that are actually thinking about it more than I typically observe that they are. And I hear rumours that actually I'm not sure which one of the big pharma guys is indeed uh, in some discussion with some of their peers about their own collective version of pay or play. And they need to. Final thing to say, which is, ties much of it together very quickly, sorry, is that reflecting on it all as an economist, and especially in ag, and Pete Borriello was here, and I think he's left, and UK, as you've heard, has done a great job on this. It's, to my slight surprise, there seems to be more progress on the demand reduction side in ag than there has been uh, in humans. Uh, and I think it's because of the power of the consumer, something we used to call the Shake Shack factor. It's not that McDonald's suddenly woke up one day and said, how do we save the world? It's because they saw if they didn't behave differently, they might lose market share to Shake Shack. And that's spreading. And India banning uh, Calistin is fat something I would have never have dreamt would have happened so quickly. It's fantastic. But what are consumers doing themselves about the pressure on pharmaceutical companies? And I see very little of that going on. The other big thing that n hardly anything's been said about is, and the single biggest disappointment is diagnostics, which to me, of the Ten Commandments, is possibly the most important. I'm going to stop there. Great. Thank you all very much. So now is the opportunity for everyone in the audience to participate, pose questions, enter into a dialogue so that we can get more out, out of this now. So um, I'm looking to see uh, your first, please. Sorry, just a moment. Ah. Hello, I'm Roz from the MSF Access to Medicines campaign. Um, given that we're obviously seeing some antibiotic shortages and the fact that the stewardship uh, models kind of conflict with current sales models, I was wondering what the panel thought about how do they see a role for publicly owned manufacturers to ensure sustainable supply of antibiotics, particularly given the latest labour announcements? Hmm. Any volunteers to take that? Have we? Yeah, so I think access to quality uh, and affordable antimicrobials is, is a big issue. And let's not forget there are uh, six million you know, people dying every year because they don't get the right quality antibiotic. So for us, stewardship is also about access. These are really, you know, the two faces of the same, the same coin. And in terms of uh, really the shortage, yes, it's of a concern. It's not only, you know, in resource limited settings. It's also a shortage in resource rich countries when we are really talking of the, uh, you know, the antibiotics, you know, the essentials. So what WHO did is what we call the AWARE, really categorizing antibiotics into those which should be accessible, into those which we should watch, and which, those which we would reserve. So what we have done is actually really creating an indicator, you know, for countries really to monitor uh, the access part of the antibiotics. So who should be, uh, those antibiotics who should be accessible, that they should target to have a 60% you know, access. So that is part of our, you know, WHO uh, uh, program uh, indicator. And we are also discussing as part of the broader, you know, SDG uh, indicator. So I think that is really an important task. In terms of the public sector taking more lead, I think the ICG uh, recommendation has actually addressed that and entertained it as one, you know, possible area that we should, we should pursue. Uh, because, I mean, yes, it's a controversial, you know, point, but at the end of the day, health is also human rights, and it should be also a social obligation for the government. Could I just add to that? Please do. Just a quick point. I mean, there are examples in, uh, for example, in India, where public procurement is being done. It's being done successfully in some states, and uh, uh, at uh, certain large organizations, but, uh, but it's tough to take this to scale from what is the experience. And if that can be achieved, I mean, we should not stop trying. That definitely is a pool procurement systems help to 
decreased shortages and decreased prices. So that has helped to a large extent. And at the national level, they're also trying to get into generics and supply them other than branded drugs. But again, there are problems and controversies like Hele mentioned. And if those challenges can be surpassed or on a larger scale rather than just small pilots, I think that is where the trick lies. Great, thank you. And you were next. Um, quick question about the delinkage. So I have here that 90% of antibiotics come from small companies, and of those 60% only make antibiotics. So what I don't quite understand is if this is going to kill 10 million people or kill everyone before climate change, what arguments would the big pharmaceutical companies give to not be investing in this, if this is going to be the big killer of humanity? I mean, just from a market perspective, it seems kind of dumb that they wouldn't be investing in this now. So, yeah. Well, Jim, that's definitely <laughs> your uh, I just, you know, I, can we spend the next three days <laughs> on this? Uh, the answer's, you know, thinking a little bit more laterally. Um, most pharmaceutical companies... I, apologize, I know there's at least a couple in the room, and I apologize to you, but it's not the first time you've heard me say this. They, they, I often think of pharma modern pharmaceutical companies, particularly the bigger ones, as being uh, balance sheet managers that just so happen to know how to manufacture and distribute pills. And uh, they, they put antibiotics and vaccines, importantly, because they are equally important, in my view, into, into their own business lines and they're expected to compete with the return on capital hurdles that they have in others. And having spent 30 years in the finance industry, that's kind of pretty dumb because not all businesses are ever going to generate the same kind of return. It's pretty obvious, really, but that's how the model seemingly continues to be. It's ridiculous. Uh, before I move to the next person, I just want to make sure, I mean, that those representatives of pharmaceutical companies, if you want to <laughs> shed some light on what your internal thinking on this, it would be a, a useful thing, Estelle. I was just going to add, you know, obviously it takes, developing any new drug product obviously it takes time. And if you look at it from the pharmaceutical point of view, if they invest all the money and all the R&D in this area and there's a risk that if we don't align, get the stewardship side um, tightened up and then the drug comes out and there's a risk, you know, when you look at the, li the pattern of resistance over time, you know, the time from introduction to resistance is getting shorter. So you think if the other areas are not tightened up and then they introduce this new product and it becomes resistant in a year or two, it's a... Uh, I'm not a, I don't work for a pharmaceutical company, <laughs> but I'm just, I'm just trying to think, you know, from that point of view, we need to look at some of the other areas that also feed into the problem why resistance happens as well. Great, thank you. Well, you have the microphone. Chatham House. Uh, just to pick up on what Jim was saying about market failure and AMR being this amazing manifestation of market failure in health, both in terms of the underinvestment in, in producing new antibiotics, but also, in, it's very highly correlated with people buying medicines over the counter in, in countries. So you get massive overconsumption of medicines, particularly, as you, you'll know, in, in, in Nigeria and India like that. And really the solution to both of those is public financing, the state taking control of the purchasing of, of medicines, and this being an absolutely essential step towards universal health coverage. Now, to get that public financing, you need real political commitment. And I, I'm just wondering that in terms of sort of getting the political commitment for AMR, that, that sort of a project fear type of approach doesn't seem to be working. We, we know that doesn't work uh, in the Brexit context as well. But to, to associate AMR more to UHC reforms, to be encouraging countries to say put 1%, 2% of their GDP into their health sector, and then top slicing money for uh, antibiotics research. Do you think that might be a better tactic than just going for the AMR route? You want to go first? Please. I just have a quick response. I mean, UHC route is definitely needed. When you have assured good quality health services, it will lead to a, a hopefully a good, I mean, a reduction or a better improvement over what we have today at present. But again, there's a need for data to be watched for that because 
UHC or universal health coverage will eventually some you know most of the time leads to clinical health care only and how does that lead to a change in resistance rate does it lead to change in prescribing practices does it lead to change in use of diagnostic services even those that are available that will come from the data and then if there's a subsequent decrease in all these I mean increase in let's say diagnostics and less of prescription does that lead to overall improvement in community acquired infections or hospital infections all that will be for the data to show because there is also that uh, danger that universal health coverage could be only used for uh, chronic or planned expensive illnesses rather than uh, short-term illnesses which lead to antibiotic use so you know the devil is in the details but definitely that's the way forward so for example India is embarking on a large drive for universal health coverage and I'm very excited about it but there's a need for that data to be shared and how it leads to a change at rural level, urban level, clinical practices, primary health care centers, and subsequently private sector, because private sector has a huge role today in India. It's a large out-of-pocket expenditure. How does that change with UHC? How does prescribing pattern change? That is the key question. Just quickly, I was just going to add in terms of agreeing with you the need for the data, but also the, is, is the regulation on how you actually put those regulations in place because antibiotics are only prescription only medicine so they should only be bought over the counter and the, and the, gov the government at the state level they are pro um, involved in the purchasing of meds but the, the challenge is they still the access despite that because you have the health system not strengthened enough so you still despite that whole drive to do the procurement and the purchasing but without fixing some of this and using the data to really inform best practice and creating some accountability. Accountability both from the users that are buying the medicines over the counter and also from the government for ensuring that those systems are in place to, to put that um, regulation in place as well. And for the next question, how it'd be really useful to get uh, the view from WHO where, where UHC is the primary objective. Yes, so, so shortly, I, I think it, it's clearly important that uh, you know, uh, UHC is uh, the true vehicle also for addressing you know, issues related to MR. It's not only about making sure quality and affordable uh, drugs, uh, antibiotics are available. It's about, um, for example, making sure there is water and sanitation in those facilities. That is all about prevention. That is all about making sure, you know, good quality health care is, is available. So let's not forget, you know, the value of the UHC agenda in also addressing this, you know, side, side issues, but important. But however, in terms of financing, I would like to, you know, point out what the ISDG has put forward as a recommendation, what we call looking into the AMR lens of existing resources uh, available. For example, uh, OECD in 2017 provided 270 billion US dollar as agriculture subsidy. Can we really look into those subsidies to farmers to make sure at least a certain portion of that is invested in preventing the creation and transmission of antibiotics? So I think we, can, we have to be quite innovative and creative in addressing the financial needs. Thank you. So I think, Daniel. Yeah, I want to react to, to two things. Um, one is um, Jim mentioned um, uh, Greta Thunberg, and I, I, we don't necessarily need uh, one person that embodies the AMR movement. But let's think back. How did AIDS, TB, and malaria and vaccines become so prominent? we uh, collectively actually funded civil society. I, I, people don't remember, but perhaps, but the Global Fund actually gave grants to countries to then fund their NGOs. Of course, Open Society Foundation does the same for democracy. I would like to um, challenge uh, Welcome Trust to say, is there a way, either directly or indirectly, to actually get that going because people are, have a lot of emotion. For example, people who have lost family members um, who, to superbugs or uh, women living with urinary tract, chronic urinary tract infections um, or people who have lost their kids because they got um, a cut um, but then they died by a superbug. So I think <clears throat> in the review, of course we haven't had a chance to read the whole thing, but it doesn't seem that um, the, the lack of civil society pushing this forward with emotion and passion um, has been assessed and how we can all 
um, perhaps um, foster that? So I, I certainly heard a challenge put forward and a challenge specifically to Welcome Trust. And I'm going to ask my colleague, Louisa, to actually talk about a small piece of work we're doing in this space because we recognize exactly what you're saying. Um, yeah, so I think, so, hi, I'm Louisa. I work at Welcome Trust, yeah, um, in the communications department. So I think there's a number of things that have been said today. Um, first of all, that there's not enough evidence about what works in terms of communications. Um, second of all, that um, the, um, the last question over there was about project fear and crisis communication doesn't work. Um, and we talked about should we frame antimicrobial resistance linked to UHC, um, but what we've been looking at are what are the most effective ways to frame the challenge in order to get political prioritization of the issue. Um, and there's a report that we will be um, disseminating at the end of the month which looks at that, so how to effectively frame antimicrobial resistance. Um, it builds on existing research in this area. Um, here we've also interviewed a number of experts um, and we have done research in seven countries um, doing qualitative and quantitative work as well. Um, and I think a key thing that we found, um, there were a number of really interesting things that we found. One around crisis communications not working and you need to offer hope and solutions and we don't do that enough within AMR communications. But the second thing, just as you said, we don't have enough human stories so we're not talking about how this is affecting people, who it's affecting. Uh, and so that's something that Welcome really wants to work with others on as well in terms of telling those personal stories, making it relevant, making it tangible. Because the facts and stats are useful in, in raising up the agenda. People who are working, you know, I work for Nesta, um, we all, all work for institutions or governments or the WHO. It's not us who directly can decide, oh, what are the compelling patient stories that we can put forward? I'm talking about enabling it's not a it's not necessarily something you do over an, a long long period but for a while to change things is actually funding civil society um, when it aligns um, with with what we do and I think that we're looking at that in terms of diagnostics because um, at the moment um, people are not buying into the idea that you should test um, before you decide um, whether or not to use antibiotics that will need civil society help as well so, so this is actually touched on an original recommendation, but also stimulated a, a lot of panelists wanting to speak. So for its first, uh, uh, Ali, um, Jim Chioti. So th thank you. So I'm, I'm, I'm speaking as someone who spent uh, 15 years working globally on TB and HIV and really working with civil society. So I have really seen it first hand, the progress and the movement of really of civil society engagement and particularly also working in partnership you know with governments and with you know UN and multilateral agencies that has really changed the whole uh, paradigm around uh, the, those critical public health issues so definitely we don't have that in antimicrobial resistance and as uh, Estelle mentioned earlier we don't have the grassroots movement for antimicrobial resistance. We don't have that one, be it in the rich countries or in the resource limited uh, settings. There are reasons for that. Of course, we don't have the finger prick test for drug resistant infection. If we have that and if we, and anybody can say that, you know, X or my husband, my wife died of drug resistant infection and I will be committed, you know, to go and fight for it, yes, but there are, of course, issues. But there are also certain things that are no-brainers. You know, we don't need really clinical randomized trials to uh, utilize some, you know, experiences and basic knowledge actually to advance. And of course, the HIV 3 by 5 when it was started, I was part of that movement. And when it was started, it was the motto was learning by doing. So we can bring that learning by doing motto also in really enhancing civil society engagement for AMR. And we need to have a public movement, we need to have a grassroots movement. That will be extremely useful. Thank you, Jim. Just in reaction to Rob and now your, your colleagues' comments about so-called project fear in this. I, I don't really agree with that. Um, it, it, but, you know, play around with phrases, but uh, it, the Ebola outbreak happened just as we started go, get going. And in my view, apologies to those deeply involved in it, this, the money that got thrown at that happened because it appeared on the major news stories in the United States and there was a risk that nobody in the US was going to travel anywhere. 
And within a week, there was more money thrown at Ebola than the whole decade cost of solving AMR. So if you don't allow the realities of what's going to happen to become part of it, you end up with ridiculously expensive solutions. So I, I kind of dispute the, the narrowness of, of, of that part of it. How it's done, in, and, and, and you know, the Article 4 thing, is a, you know, because it has to be seen in the context of, in, in, the, in the big emerging world of the overall health systems. But. Just a quick comment to add on to that. I mean, it's a great thought, but I think, again, we are missing the point that AMR is not just a health issue. It is a development yeah. issue. You can't just have patient stories. I mean, it sounds really great. One, there's privacy involved in it. But practically speaking, it's, it's not just about health that we are talking. You're talking about a farmer and his livelihood. And for that, you need a more compelling story rather than people dying. People dying today is not a reality for him rather than putting food on the plate for his family. So I think that is, again, where we have to frame AMR as a development issue. There's a saying in Buddhism, which I would just like to quote here, it's not about having faith like fire. It's about having faith like flowing water. <laughs> it's to be there, sustained, consistent. So we have to remember that story about AMR and consistently talk that same language so that you know, everybody realizes. And I agree with you on the overall principle. It's not reach the masses. I, my family tomorrow, when my dad is sick, He's after a, after a week's time, he's like, I'm going to start an antibiotic. And after co convincing him, working on AMR, it's tough to get that message. So we need to reach out to the masses, but probably our story needs to be framed in a different manner. So the study that she's talking about, I think it really makes sense. That's what's coming from the ground, and we must respect that evidence and reinvent and come back to the table to think what we should do. Great, Can thank I just you. Add so, one thing? please do. Um, just in terms of the story, Let's so there's that. Vanessa Carter, who some people may know, you know, she had a very horrific experience with um, MRSA in, from South Africa. She's been really pushing the, the agenda from the face of AMR. So, you know, there, there needs to be some more of that as well, as well as what you said about the development issue. But also looking at the agri sector, um, I remember in Nigeria where they had the avian flu influenza issue, where the farmers were compensated. Sometimes it comes down to as basic as that. The farmers were compensated when the you know, they mentioned that their farm was affected and the cost for them was compensated. But with AMR, you know, a lot of farmers put antibiotics in their feed, et cetera, et cetera, and no one is having that conversation with them to say that if this happens to you, you will get that same compensation. So sometimes it needs to be that realistic and that basic to say that you will compensate if things happen and, and use those examples of when, what happened with avian influenza when so many... Um, so many people's livelihoods were affected, but they got some compensation. So it's, yeah. So we've run over time, and, and I don't want to abuse the panel's uh, generosity too much, but we, we're having a dynamic discussion, and, and I at least want to pick up two people, if not other questions, as long as we, we want to go before breaking for lunch. So um, first here. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dawn Howard, and I'm from NOAA representing the uh, UK animal health sector. And thank you very much for the recognition that agriculture has actually made great progress here in the UK. Um, but obviously there's still more progress to be made and this is a global issue, not talking about just about the UK. One thing which is really important is behavior change. We're talking about antimicrobial resistance. We're not just talking about antibiotics. What we need to be able to do is to improve farmer skills, improve farm biosecurity, and very importantly, improve uptake of preventative measures such as vaccines. What can be done to incentivize that behavior change? E easy. De deliberate, I mean, it's an economic policy choice. Encourage vaccines at the expense of uh, antibiotics. It was one of our 29 specific recommendations. Pretty straightforward. It yeah. staggers me how uh, vaccines aren't pursued more in the animal challenge. Staggering. And I don't know if Juan's still connected. If, if Juan is, it'd be great to hear a response from FAO. And just to add to that, I think, oh, he's there? Yeah. Or is that? Or is he is here. Yeah. Sorry. Might be having a little nap. May I, may I jump in on, on that particular map? Could you, you repeat the connection is not as good at the moment? Ah, 
It's a shame. I think uh, he's trying to get. I think there's a big lag in the connection. So maybe we'll hold and see if, if Juan's able to to jump on. We'll follow with the next question, please. Stop AIDS, um, part of a, a grassroots movement that's working uh, the HIV response globally, um, and also part of movements that across the EU um, and also globally that are calling for new innovation models and access to medicines. So some of it is there in terms of that grassroots movement. Um, I wanted to highlight that you know AMR is one example of where um, there is a market failure and and the, in the current. Um, model for innovation that relies on intellectual property as an incentive is, is not working. But there are also other examples of that, um, you know, t TB being an example, neglected tropical diseases, um, you know, a less uh, research f amongst women uh, who are pregnant. Um, and, and there's also a, a drive to have many uh, Me Too medicines and kind of similar innovations. So um, there are international discussions happening. Um, you know, the UN High Level Panel on Access to Medicines released a report about the need for new innovation models and, and those discussions are happening at the international level. So I was wondering how you think we should connect, if this conversation should be connected with the other market failures um, of innovation. Um, yeah, that's my question. Thanks. Great, thank you. That's a, a, a big question um, and an important one in this discussion. Uh, Jim, if you could start, and I think highly maybe this is something as well you're pondering. Well, I, Trying to understand what you're really asking would require more time. Um, you know, there's, at the early stage funding, I think the past three years has demonstrated there isn't a market failure. Uh, there could end up being one if we don't solve the, what's called the pull factor. There's clear market failure there. But, um, so I don't think it's across the whole chain to do with, with drugs. Um, the second thing to say, and it hasn't got a lot of air time yet. You know, to me, there's, there's probably a bigger market failure in the role of diagnostics. Um, and it, I find it you know, amazing that there isn't, and apologies to people, now I don't, I don't mind annoying anybody, as many of you know. I don't understand here in the UK, which correctly sees itself as a leader, why it is still the case today that DH hasn't embarked on a full system-wide uh, project to demonstrate what I would highly confidently guess, dramatic productivity and cost savings of embedding point-of-care diagnostics across the whole system. It, might, it would help them solve some of the growing dilemmas by deliberately uh, and impressively on one level uh, controlling the use of uh, antibiotics, uh, as a stud people here may have been involved in these studies, that it actually means that some people, and of course a huge problem in the emerging world, some people who need antibiotics can't get them because of the aggressiveness of these targets. So you, that market failure is enormous, um, and yet there's not a lot being done about that one. And I, you know, I could go on, but I don't really know. You, I think you're just talking about the drugs, right? But the, the, the push side, there isn't a market failure. Yeah, so, uh, yeah I, I think this is really uh, an open you know, question. Mm. Um, there is no easy answer. Uh, you know, what is the best or how to also address it. But I think in our revitalized <coughs> you know, approach, what we are really planning to take is to take these debates and discussions in a more you know, synergistic and complementary you know, manner so that we will get something ultimately that will benefit uh, humanity. So I think that should be our collective goal really to discuss what is you know, good for, for humanity. So I think that uh, discussion we are intending also really to catalyze and you know, push the agenda forward. Yeah. Great, thank you. What I suggest is that uh, we now look to, to break and there is a lunch reception downstairs. We can uh, pick up discussions there in a more informal fashion. Um, you know, what we certainly have heard is that there is some progress in relationship to what has happened from those recommendations. There are areas where there is not sufficient progress, uh, and, and we need to consider about what it takes to redouble our efforts. We heard that there are big gaps 
um, in terms of how we get things down to country level, and then even further driving down to grassroots level. Those are, are areas we need to, to uh, redouble our efforts and think, what does it need to do to achieve that? There are questions about where are we in terms of political momentum. Uh, we've achieved good political momentum, um, and it's at risk that that is uh, not sufficient to really achieve the long-term goals. There are issues on language gaps. Uh, we need to, to break down the accusations, the sense that, that there are trade-offs that prevent us in having action overall. Uh, but we still need to drive forward for a positive awareness, bring stakeholders together, uh, build a global stakeholder map, and be, be more clear about the responsibilities uh, in terms of what is done. A uh, very interesting point here that uh, we need to, ch to change this from a research topic to an action plan. And I, I still recognize we are stuck a little bit in that, that mode of thinking. Uh, but uh, you know, lastly, I, I want to say that, yes, we're making good progress. Let's indeed use learning by doing to move forward and consider how do we mobilize the financing to support action in this area. Thank you all very much.